Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you can become a Patreon and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. At noon in a wide green meadow on the lush table hand that was the top of the impossibly balanced Wormberg, the dragons and their riders formed a wide circle. There was room beyond them for a rabble of servants and slaves and others who scratched a living here on the roof of the world, and they were all watching the figures clustered in the center of the grassy arena. The group contained a number of senior dragon lords, and among them were Liort and his brother Laertes. The former was still rubbing his legs with small grimaces of pain. Slightly to one side stood Lysa and Hrun, who some, with some of the woman's other fo own followers. Between the two factions stood the Wormberg's hereditary lore master. As you know, he said uncertainly, the not fully late lord of the Wormberg, Gracia I, has stipulated that there will be no succession until one of his children feels himself, or as it might be herself, powerful enough to challenge and defeat his or her siblings in mortal combat. Yes, yes, we know all that. Get on with it, said a thin, peevish voice from the air beside him. The lore master swallowed. He had never come to terms with his former master's failure to expire properly. Is the old buzzer dead or isn't he? he wondered. It is not certain, he quavered, whether it is allowed to issue a challenge by proxy. It is, it is, snapped Gracia's disembodied voice. It shows intelligence. Don't take all day about it. I challenge you, said Hrun, glaring at the brothers, both at once. Leort and Laertes exchanged looks. You'll fight us both together, said Laertes, a tall, wiry man with long black hair. Yeah. That's pretty uneven odds, isn't it? Yeah, I outnumber you one to two. Leort scowled. You arrogant barbarian. That just about does it, growled Hrun. I'll... The lore master put out a blue-veined hand to restrain him. It is forbidden to fight on the killing ground, he said, and paused while he considered the sense of this. You know what I mean, anyway. He hazarded, giving up and adding, As the challenge parties, my lords Leort and Leortes have chosen, have choice of weapons. Dragons, they said together. Lysa snorted. Dragons can't be used offensively, therefore they are weapons, said Leort firmly. If you disagree, we can fight over it. Yeah, said his brother, nodding at Hrun. The lore master felt a ghostly finger prod him in the chest. Don't stand there with your mouth open, said Gracia's graveyard voice. Just hurry up, will you? Hrun stepped back, shaking his head. Oh no, he said. Once was enough. I'd rather be dead than fight on one of those things. Die then, said the lore master as kindly as he could manage. Leort and Laertes were already striding back across the turf to where the servants stood waiting with their mounts. Hrun turned to Lysa. She shrugged. Don't I even get a sword, he pleaded? A knife even? No, she said. I didn't expect this. She suddenly looked smaller, all defiance gone. I'm sorry. You're sorry? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I thought you said you're sorry. Don't glare at me like that. I can imagine you the finest dragon to ride. No. The lore master whipped his no wiped his nose on a handkerchief, held the little silken square aloft for a moment, then let it fall. A boom of wings made Hrun spin around. Luort's dragon was already airborne and circling around towards them. As it swooped low over the turf, a billow of flame shot from its mouth, scoring a black streak across the grass that rushed towards Hrun. At the last minute, he pushed Lysa aside and felt the wild pain of the flame on his arm as he dived for safety. He rolled as he hit the ground and flipped onto his feet again while he looked around frantically for the other dragon. It came in from one side, and Hrun was forced to take a badly judged standing jump to escape the flame. The dragon's tail whipped around, as it passed and caught him a stinging blow across the forehead. 
He pushed himself upright, shaking his head to make the wheeling stars go away. His blistered back screamed pain at him. <laughs> Liort came in for a second run, but slower this time to allow for the big man's unexpected agility. As the ground drifted up, he saw the barbarian standing stock still, chest heaving, arms hanging loosely by his sides. An easy target. As his dragon swooped away, Liort turned his head, expecting to see a dreadfully big cinder. There was nothing there. Puzzled, Liort turned back. Frun, having himself, heaving himself over the dragon's shoulder scales with one hand and beating out his flaming hair with the other, presented himself to his view. Liort's hand flew to his dagger, but pain had sharpened Frun's normally except excellent reflexes to needle point. A backhand blow hammered into the dragon lord's wrist, sending the dagger arcing away toward the ground, and another caught the man full on in the chin. The dragon, carrying the weight of two men, was only a few yards above the grass. This turned out to be fortunate because at the moment Liort lost consciousness, the dragon winked out of existence. Lysa hurried across the grass and helped Fran stagger to his feet. He blinked at her. What happened? What happened? He said thickly. That was really fantastic, she said. The way you turned that somersault in midair and everything? Yeah, but what happened? It's rather difficult to explain. Run peered up at the sky. Liartes, by far the most cautious of the two brothers, was circling high above them. Well, you've got about ten seconds to try, he said. The dragons, yeah, they're imaginary. Like all these imaginary burns on my arms, you mean? Yes, no, she shook her head violently. I'll have to tell you later. Fine, if you can find a really good medium, snapped Run. He glared up at Liartes, who was beginning to descend in wide sweeps. Just listen, will you? Unless my brother is conscious, his dragon can't exist. I've got no pathway through to this. Run, shouted Run. He threw her away from him and flung himself flat on the ground as Liartes' dragon thundered by, leaving another smoking scar across the turf. While the creature sought height for another sweep, Frun scrambled to his feet and set off at a dead run for the woods at the edge of the arena. They were sparse, little more than a wide and overgrown hedge, but at least no dragon would be able to fly through them. It didn't try. Laertes brought his mount in to land on the turf a few yards away and dismounted casually. The dragon folded its wings and poked its head in among the greenery, while its master leaned against a tree and whistled tunelessly. I can burn you out, said Laertes after a while. The bushes remained motionless. Perhaps you're in that holly bush over there. The holly bush became a waxy ball of flame. I'm sure I can see movement in those ferns. The ferns became mere skeletons of white ash. You're only prolonging it, barbarian. Why not give in now? I've burned lots of people. It doesn't hurt a bit, said Laertes, looking sideways at the bushes. The dragon continued through the spiny, incinerating, every likely-looking bush and clump of ferns. Laertes drew his sword and waited. Frun dropped from a tree and landed running. Behind him, the dragon roared and crashed through the bushes as it tried to turn around. But Frun was running, running with his gaze fixed on Laertes and a dead branch in his hands. It is a little known but true fact that a two-legged creature can usually beat a four-legged creature over a short distance, simply because of the time it takes the quadruped to get its legs sorted out. Frun heard the scrabble of claws behind him and then an ominous thump. The dragon had half opened its wings and was trying to fly. As Frun bore down on the dragon lord, Laertes' sword came up wickedly to be caught on the branch. Then Frun... A uh, cannoned into him, and the two men sprawled on the ground. The dragon roared. Laertes screamed as Hrun brought a knee upward with anatomical precision, but managed a wild blow that rebroke the barbarian's nose for him. Hrun kicked away and scrambled to his feet to find himself looking up into the wild horse face of the dragon, its nostrils distended. He lashed out with a foot and caught Laertes, who was trying to stand up in the side of the head. The man slumped. The dragon vanished. The ball of fire that was billowing towards Run faded until, when it reached him, it was no more than a puff of warm air. 
There was no sound but the crackle of burning bushes. Run slung the unconscious dragon lord over his shoulder and set off at a trot back to the arena. Halfway there he found Leort sprawled on the ground, one leg bent awkwardly. He stooped and with a grunt hoisted the man onto his vacant shoulder. Lysa and the lore master were waiting on a raised dais at one end of the meadow. The dragon woman had quite recovered her composure now and looked levelly at Frun as he threw the two men down on the steps before her. The people around her were standing in deferential poses like a court. Kill them, she said. I kill in my own time, he said. In any case, killing unconscious people isn't right. I can't think of a more opportune time, said the lore master. Lysa snorted. Then I shall banish them, she said. Once they are beyond the reach of the Wormberg's magic, then they'll have no power. They'll be simply brigands. Will that satisfy you? Yes. I am surprised that you are so merciful, but... Hrun. Hrun shrugged. A man in my position, he can't afford to be anything else. He's got to consider his image. He looked around. Where's the next test, then? I warn you that it is perilous. If you wish, you may leave now. If you pass the test, however, you will become Lord of the Wormberg and, of course, my lawful husband. Hrun met her gaze. He thought about his life to date. It suddenly seemed to him to have been full of long, damp nights sleeping under the stars, desperate fights with trolls, city guards, countless bandits, and evil priests, and on at least three occasions, actual demigods. And for what? Well, for quite a lot of treasure, he had to admit. But where had it all gone? Rescuing beleaguered maidens had a certain passing reward, but most of the time he'd finished up by settling them up in some city somewhere with a handsome dowry, because after a while even the most agreeable ex-maiden became possessive and had scant sympathy for his efforts to rescue her sister sufferers. In short, life had really left him with little more than a reputation and a network of scars. Being a lord might be fun. Frun grinned. With a base like this, all of these dragons and a good bunch of fighting men, a man could really be a contender. Besides, the wench was not uncomely. The third test, he said. Am I to be weaponless again? Said Frun. Lysa reached up and removed her helmet, letting the coil of red hair tumble out. She then unfashioned the brooch of her robe. Underneath, she was naked. As Hrun Gay swept over her, his mind began to operate two notional, notional counting machines. One assessed the gold in her bangles, the tiger rubies that ornamented her toe rings, the diamond spangle that adored her navel, and two highly individual whirligigs of silver filigree. The others... The other was plugged straight into his libido. Both produced tallies that pleased him mightily. As she raised a hand and proffered a glass of wine, she smiled and said, I think not. He didn't attempt to rescue you, Rincewind pointed out as a last resort. He clung desperately to Two Flower's waist as the dragon circled slowly, tilting the world at a dangerous angle. The new knowledge that the scaly back... He was astride, only existed as a sort of three-dimensional daydream, did not, he had soon realized, do anything at all for his ankle-wrenching sensation of vertigo. His mind kept straying toward the possible results of Two Flower losing his concentration. Not even Hrun could have prevailed against those crossbows, said Two Flower stoutly. As the dragon rose higher above the patch of woodland, where the three of them had slept a damp and uneasy sleep, the sun rose over the edge of the disk. Instantly, the gloomy blues and grays of pre-dawn were transformed into a bright bronze river that flowed across the world, flaring into gold where it struck ice or water or a light dam. Owing to the density of the magical fields surrounding the disk, light itself moved at sub subsonic speeds. This interesting property was well utilized by the Sorka people of the Great Neff, for example who over the centuries had constructed intricate and delicate dams and valleys walled with polished silica to catch the slow sunlight and sort of store it. The scintillating reservoirs of the Neff overflowing after several weeks of uninterrupted sunlight were a truly magnificent sight from the air, and it is therefore unfortunate that Two Flower and Rincewind did not happen to glance in that direction. In front of them, the billion-ton impossibility that was the magic rot Wormberg hung against the sky 
and that was not too bad until Rincewind turned his head and saw the mountain's shadow slowly enroll itself across the cloudscape of the world. What can you see, said Two Flower to the dragon. I see fighting on the top of the mountain, came the gentle reply. See, said Two Flower, Run's probably fighting for his life at this very moment. Rincewind was silent. After a moment, Two Flower looked around. The wizard was staring intently at nothing at all, his lips moving soundlessly. Rincewind? The wizard made a small croaking noise. I'm sorry, said Two Flower. What did you say? All the way. The Great Fall, muttered Rincewind. His eyes focused, looked puzzled for a moment, then widened in terror. He made the mistake of looking down. Ugh, he opined, and began to slide. Two Flower grabbed him. What's the matter? Rincewind tried shutting his eyes, but there were no eyelids to his imagination, and it was staring wildly. Don't you get scared of heights, he managed to say. Two Flower looked down at the tiny landscape, mottled with cloud shadows. The thought of fear hadn't actually occurred to him. No, he said, why should I? You're just as dead if you fall from 40 feet as you are from 4,000 fathoms, that's what I say. Rincewind tried to consider this dispassionately, but couldn't see the logic of it. It wasn't the actual falling, it was the hitting he... Two Flower grabbed him quickly. Steady on, he said cheerfully, we're nearly there. I wish I was back in the city, moaned Rincewind. I wish I was back on the ground. I wonder if dragons can fly all the way to the stars, mused Two Flower. Now that would be something. You're mad, said Rincewind flatly. There was no reply from the tourist, and when the wizard craned around, he was horrified to see Two Flower looking up at the paling stars with an odd smile on his face. Don't you even think about it, added Rincewind menacingly. The man you seek is talking to the dragon woman, said the dragon. Hmm, said Two Flower, still looking at the paling stars. What? said Rincewind urgently. Oh yes, run, said Two Flower. I hope we're in time. Dive now, go low. Rincewind opened his eyes as the wind increased to a whistling gale. Perhaps they were blown open. The wind certainly made them impossible to shut. The flat summit of the Wormberg rose up at them, lurching alarmingly, then somersaulted into a green blur that flashed by on either side. Tiny woods and fields blurred into a, a rushing patchwork. A brief silvery flash in the landscape may have been the little river that overflowed into the air at the plateau's rim. Rincewind tried to force the memory out of his mind, but it was rather enjoying itself there, terrorizing the other occupants and kicking over the furniture. I think not, said Lysa. Run took the wine cup slowly. He grinned like a pumpkin. Around the arena, the dragon started to bay. The riders looked up, and something like a green blur flashed across the arena, and Hrun had gone. The wine cup hung momentarily in the air, then crashed down on the steps. Only then did a single drop spill. This was because in the instant of enfolding Hrun gently in his claws, nine reeds of the dragon had momentarily synchronized their bodily rhythms, since the dimensions of the imagination is much more complex than those of time and space, which are very junior dimensions indeed, the effect of this was to instantly transform a stationary and preapic run into a run moving sideways at 80 miles an hour with no ill effect whatsoever, except for a few wasted mouthfuls of wine. Another effect was to cause Lysa to scream with rage and summon her dragon. As the gold beast materialized in front of her, she leapt astride it, still naked, and snatched a crossbow from one of the guards. Then she was airborne, while the other dragon riders swarmed towards their own beast. The lore master watching from the pillar he had prudently slid behind in the mad scramble happened at that moment to catch the cross-dimensional echoes of a theory being at the same instant hatched in the mind of an early psychiatrist in an adjacent universe, possibly because the dimension leak was flowing both ways and for a moment the psychiatrist saw the girl on the dragon. The lore master smiled. Want to bet that she won't catch him, said Gracia, in the voice of worms and sepulchres, right by his ear. The lore master shut his eyes and swallowed hard. I thought that my lord would now be residing fully in the dre dreadland he managed. I am a wizard, said Gracia. Death himself must claim a wizard, and 
Aha, he doesn't appear to be in the neighborhood. Shall we go? asked Death. He was on a white horse, a horse of flesh and blood, but red of eye and fiery of nostril. And he stretched out a bony hand and took Gracious Soul out of the air and rolled it up until it was a point of painful light, and then he swallowed it. Then he clapped spurs to his steed and it sprang into the air, sparks coruscating from its hooves. Lord Gracia, whispered the old lore master as the universe flickered around him. That was a mean trick, came the wizard's voice, a mere speck of sound disappearing into the infinite black dimensions. My lord, what is death like? called the old man tremulously. When I have investigated it fully, I will let you know, came the faintest of modulations on the breeze. Yes, murmured the lore master. A thought struck him. During daylight, please, he added. You clown, screamed Run from his perch on Nine Reed's foreclaws. What did he say? roared Rincewind as the dragon ripped its way through the air in the race for the heights. Didn't hear, bellowed Two Flower, his voice torn away by the gale. As the dragon banked slightly, he looked down at the little toy spinning top that was the mighty Wormberg and saw the swarm of creatures rising in pursuit. Nine Reed's wings pounced and flicked the air away contemptuously. Thinner air, too. Two Flower's ears popped for the third time. Ahead of the swarm, he noticed, was a golden dragon. Someone on it, too. Hey, are you all right? said Rincewind urgently. He had to drink in several lungfuls of the strangely distilled air in order to get the words out. I could have been a lord, and you clowns had to go in, run gasped, as the chill, thin air drew the life even out of his mighty chest. What's happening to the air? muttered Rincewind. Blue lights appeared in front of his eyes, Ugh, said Two Flower, and passed out. The dragon vanished. For a few seconds, the three men continued upward, Two Flower and the wizard presenting an odd picture as they sat one in front of the other with their legs astride something that wasn't there. Then what passed for gravity on the disc recovered from the surprise and claimed them. At that moment, Lysa's dragon flashed by and Hrun landed heavily across its back. Lysa leaned over and kissed him. This detail was not lost to Rincewind as he dropped away, with his arms still clasped around Two Flower's waist. The disc was a little round map pinned against the sky. It didn't appear to be moving, but Rincewind knew that it was. The whole world was coming towards him like a giant custard pie. Wake up, he shouted above the roar of the wind. Dragons! Think of dragons! There was a flurry of wings as they plummeted through the host of pursuing creatures, which fell away and up. Dragons screamed and wheeled across the sky. No answer came from Two Flower. Rincewind's robe whipped around him, but he did not wake. Dragons, thought Rincewind in a panic. He tried to concentrate his mind, tried to envisage a real lifelike dragon. If he can do it, he thought, then so can I. But nothing happened. The disc was bigger now. A cloud swirled circle rising gently underneath them. Rincewind tried again, screwing up his eyes and straining every nerve in his body. A dragon, his imagination, a somewhat battered and overused organ, reached out for a dragon. Any dragon. It won't work, laughed a small voice like the dull toning of a funeral bell. You don't believe in them. Rincewind looked at the terrible mounted apparition grinning at him, and his mind bolted in terror. There was a brilliant flash. There was utter darkness. There was a soft floor under Rincewind's feet, a pink light around him, and the sudden shocked cries of many people. He looked around wildly. He was standing in some kind of tunnel which was mostly filled with seats in which outlandishly dressed people had been strapped. They were all shouting at him. Wake up, he hissed. Help me! Dragging the still unconscious tourist with him, he backed away from the mob until his free hand found an oddly shaped door handle. He twisted it and ducked through, then slammed it hard. He stared around the new room in which he found himself and met the terrified gaze of a young woman who dropped the tray she was holding and screamed. It sounded like the sort of scream that brings muscular help. Rincewind, awash with fear distilled adrenaline, turned and barged past her. There were more seats here, and the people in them ducked as he dragged Two Flower urgently along the central gangway. Beyond the rows of seats were little windows. Beyond the windows, 
against a background of fleecy clouds was a dragon's wing. It was silver. I've been eaten by a dragon, he thought. That's ridiculous, he replied. You can't see out of dragons. Then his shoulder hit the door at the far end of the tunnel, and he followed it through into a cone-shaped room that was even stranger than the tunnel. It was full of tiny glittering lights. Among the lights and contoured chairs were four men who were now staring at him open-mouthed. As he stared back, he saw their gazes dart sideways. Rincewind turned slowly. Beside him was a fifth man, youngish, bearded, as swarthy as the nomad folk of the great Neff. Where am I, said the wizard, in the belly of a dragon? The young man crouched back and shoved a small black box in the wizard's face. The men in the chairs ducked down. What is it, said Rincewind, a picture box? He reached out and took it, a movement which appeared to surprise the swarthy man, who shouted and tried to snatch it back. There was another shout, this time from one of the men in the chairs. Only now he wasn't sitting. He was standing up, pointing something small and meta metallic at the young man. It had an amazing effect. The man crouched back with his hands in the air. Please give me the bomb, sir, said the man with the metallic thing. Carefully, please. This thing, said Rincewin. You have it. I don't want it. The man took it very carefully and put it on the floor. The seated man relaxed and one of them started speaking urgently to the wall. The wizard watched him in amazement. Don't move, snapped the man with the metal. An amulet, Rincewind decided. It must be an amulet. The swarthy man backed into the corner. That was a very brave thing you did, said the amulet holder to Rincewind. You know that? What? What's the matter with your friend? Friend? Rincewind looked down at Two Flower, who was still slumbering peacefully. There was no surprise. That was no surprise. What was really surprising was that Two Flower was wearing new clothes. Strange clothes. His breeches now ended just above his knees. Above that, he wore some sort of vest of brightly striped material. On his head was a ridiculous little straw hat with a feather in it. An awkward feeling around the leg region made Rincewind look down. His clothes had changed too. Instead of the comfortable old robe so marvelously well adapted for speed into action in all possible contingencies, his legs were encased in cloth tubes. He was wearing a jacket of the same gray material. Until now, he'd never heard the language the man had with the amulet was using. It was uncouth and vaguely hublandish. So why could he understand every word? Let's see, they'd suddenly appeared in this dragon after they'd materialized in this drag... They'd said... They'd... They'd... They'd had struck up a conversation in the airport so naturally that had chosen to sit together on the plane, and he'd promised to show Jack Zwiebelman around when Zweiblumen, around when they got back to the States. Yes, that was it. And then Jack had been taken ill and he'd panicked and come through here and surprised this hijacker. Of course. What on earth was Hublandish? Dr. Rinzwan rubbed his forehead. What he could do with was a drink.